Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Skeleton Crew. I'm your host, Jen Callahan, and today I have a great guest with me. Her name is Marissa Fair. Uh, she's like a powerhouse of a woman. She is involved in so much stuff and doing so much work for, for women's health care right now. Um, but her current role is CEO of Deep Look Medical, which I'm going to let her talk about the ins and outs of what this amazing company is doing for women's health care right now. So, Marissa, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with me. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And I'm super excited for us to discuss uh, Deep Look Medical and then the DL Precise of what uh, the technology that you guys are using for women's health care. So I'm going to, well, how about we just start talking about you first? Give us the little ins and outs of how you ended up where you currently are, because you're involved in so many different things between being on advisory boards and committee boards. And like, you know, you've just transformed through different um, pass of life leading yourself to here. So give us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I have no idea how I got here. So let's be <laughs> clear. It was uh, it was not an intentional linear uh, <laughs> linear ride. Um, but uh, I'm an engineer by background with an MBA and um, I started in med tech. So I spent 15 years in corporate as an engineer, you know, rising through the ranks, project management, um, product management, did a lot of mergers and acquisition work as well. Um, I developed the 3D mammography system and rolled the first 10 off the production line with, you know, with a massive team. And um, yeah, and then, uh, you know, I was working for a very large women's health company, Hologic, for nine years. And so, you know, it kind of married my passion for women in STEM and, you know, women in general. And I kind of found my my love. And um, but, you know, after 15 years and being in corporate and living in multiple countries and good driving everywhere and doing everything and you know, doing, going really hard. Um, I probably burnt out before it was a thing. Yeah. And um, <laughs> now everyone talks about it, but it wasn't a thing back then. And then um, I actually started my own consulting firm because um, I kind of became an entrepreneur. Uh, and again, I fell into it. Now people love to be entrepreneurs, but uh, back, uh, you know, ba back then that wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I started a consulting firm that I ran for about nine years started a global nonprofit focused on women's health um, that uh, I still run as a CEO. And um, yeah, I started, you know, doing a lot more speaking and I gave a TEDx and I was speaking at conferences and all of these other things. And, um, you know, led me to doing a lot of strategic advisory work. Um, a lot it allowed me to sit on, start sitting on some boards and advisory boards, started working with some venture funds as well. And um I fell, fell into Deep Look. Uh, they heard me speaking at a conference and uh, uh, two of the co-founders came up to me and said, you're going to be our CEO. And I was like, we've never met. So <laughs> let's have that discussion first. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I joined them uh, on the advisory board for several years and actually took it uh, through COVID. And then after a while, um, you know, they knew and I knew that there needed to be, um, you know, strategic uh, leadership who was in the industry, who knew it well, um, and who could be the spokesman for the company. And uh, I said, yes, finally. Yeah. So then let's dive into Deep Look. Give us a background of what Deep Look is. Yeah, it's a software technology company with our flagship product called DL Precise, which is already FDA cleared and commercial. So uh, we're actually in the US, UK and Canada currently. And um, we are software that can visualize um, soft tumor lesions, and uh, we can do that throughout the entire imaging continuum, so ultrasound, mammography, CT, and MR, and for all, um, uh, all health areas, about uh, all 38 of them. So, but our special sauce is that we can see inside dense tissue, and we actually visualize the lesion, not a generalized region. Um, which so many of the other companies do, but we're very lesion, you know, specific mm -hmm. and um, our being able to visualize in dense tissue makes us very applicable for breast imaging, right. thyroid, liver, lung. Many of those are women's health issues. Um, so we are definitely a women's health company first and foremost, um, but an imaging company. And um, yeah, that's, that is very much what we do. We are not diagnostic. Uh, we're not decision support. We are a visual tool for one-click measurement, segmentation, and visualization um, of a specific lesion. It's run by radiologists on demand when they need it. It is not automated. It doesn't happen every time. Um, and so that's uh, what we do. We're, at, we're a tool to help them visualize and hopefully reduce the amount of supplemental imaging that they have to send women for or biopsies 
um, that are unnecessary and just because they can't see. So if they have this tool to be able to see and visualize, maybe some of those could be reduced and that's what we're working on. Would you say, or do you possibly know the stats behind this, um, are, are a good amount of women percentage wise have dense breasts? Yeah, so 45% okay. of all women around the world have dense breasts. It also disproportionately affects black women, Asian women, and Jewish women, which means it's an equity issue as well. And um, yeah, so I mean, literally 25% of the entire world population, includes men, mm -hmm. have dense breasts. So, I mean, you know, I, I hope nobody questions me if this is a niche area for us to be in. Uh, <laughs> I still get it, but it's not. Uh, literally affects 25% of the whole world. But yeah, 45%, 45 to 50% of all women have dense breast tissue. The mm -hmm. issue, obviously, you know, that you can't visualize and see with it, you know, within it. So, I mean, you're looking, you know, you're looking at the cloud and you're trying to find the plane. Well, if it's in the cloud, you can't see it. And that's unfortunately where, you know, where a lot of the, the masses seem to grow. Um, the other stat is that of breast cancers that are detected, 71% of them are in dense breasts. Okay. So, I mean, this is a problem. And, you know, just because of the genetics, three to four times more likely to develop breast cancer. So a whole lot of stats out there, which just means having dense breasts makes you have a higher proclivity to having breast cancer. And if you can't see inside the tissue to see if something's there, you often have to go for secondary, tertiary, you know, further imaging, mm -hmm. which is, you know, expensive to sometimes the woman, um, but the healthcare system. And, you know, imagine the stress and the anxiety, right. um, having to do this, you have to do this every year, or every six months or all of these things and not knowing and then, you know, it's stressful in radiologists too. Like they want, you know, there's, there's really nobody who goes into medicine who doesn't want to help their patients. And so them not having answers or, you know, something definitive, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard for everybody. And so this gives um, a, a, an ability to be able to visualize better. And listen, I'm not saying that we should not send, you know, if you have dense breasts, you should absolutely still go for your, 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 your ultrasound and your secondary imaging. That is finally almost government mandated. And it's in about 41 states now um, that insurance is covering it. But I mean, you should still be going for that. I'm not, we're not trying to reduce that. We're trying to reduce all the additional on top of that. And right. the other horrible statistic is that over 90% of all biopsies are on benign lesions. I mean, so women are being jammed with these right. horrible biopsy needles and I, I used to manufacture them. So I know how bad they are yeah. and um, you know, they're not pleasant and it's really an excruciating process. So even if we can reduce that and the anxiety and um, the unnecessary testing, I mean, that's, that's what we're here for. Right. I, I like the analogy that you use with the with the plane in the clouds, because I was reading earlier on the site, you know, talking about the difference between dense breasts and non-dense breasts. And I unfortunately am not very, even though I am a woman, I'm not very, I feel like very knowledgeable on dense non-breast, dense breasts and what they look like. And even though I do work in radiology, what they actually look like on screen. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting for me to read that like a non-dense breast appears to be, you know, it's black and then, you know, the lesion would show up as white. So it's very, yeah. you know, clear. Um, but for the dense breasts, the whole breast basically looks grayish, white. right? Or white. Yeah. Yeah. It looks, it, it just, and it depends on, you know, obviously there's different gradients of density. Um, the other issue is also that the younger you are, typically the denser your breasts are. And yeah. as we've been seeing in a lot of the new reports coming out, younger women are developing breast cancer earlier. And, you know, there's a whole host of things that can go into that, but it includes a lot of the environmental factors, a lot of the chemicals, you know, that we've been ingesting and, you know, um, it, you know, girls having, you know, going through puberty earlier, um, which just sets, you know, sets everything in motion a little bit earlier. Um, and so imaging in younger women in more dense breasts who, you know, because density oftentimes um, evens out over time as you get older. Um, but just generally, I mean, to, to be able to see inside something, you know, that's dense, it's very hard and it's opposite on ultrasound. Okay. So, um, you know, so it shows up black. 
<laughs> um, um, but if you have an all black, you know, a playing field, you know, you're looking at the asphalt and you're trying to find the little, you know, gray dot in there, good luck to you. Right. Um, so same thing. So it's, you know, and, and this applies to other tissues, which are, um, you know, thyroid and lung, where you can have so many nodules. Right. Um, you don't know what's what, you don't know the measurement of all of them. You have to measure 30 nodules and, um, you know, it's time consuming. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we're here for. So the radiologist looking at the image, um, like you said, it's something that they can choose to use or not use. Um, yeah. Would they click on a specific lesion or area of interest and then, or does it just like highlight everything? It has to be click specific. It has to be click specific because what we've been seeing and what the industry has been showing us in general um, is that there's a lot of information now on the screen. There's tons of AI tools. There's tons of triage. There's tons of markings. It's a lot. It's a lot for the radiologist to see. We only want them to use this when they want to because they, they're going to dismiss 80 to 90 percent of what's on the screen. We don't have them want them to dismiss something else like they don't, we don't need to add workflow to their job. Mm. There's already, you know, radiologist shortage. It's going to get worse over time. There are, everyone's already time crunched. So the point is when they want to use this, you know, they quote unquote double click and it activates mm. and they can use it when they want. You know, you're not going to use this oftentimes on a fatty breast because you already can see what's there, you know, or if, a, if something's very obvious, but you might want to. Mm -hmm. Also, we can present in color and we can show different shades of density within that mass. So we can actually almost make it more interesting because mammograms are black and white. Um, you know, other imaging modalities are oftentimes shown in color, but mammography is black and white. And you know what? Eight hours a day staring at black and white it's boring. And uh, so, so oftentimes they're like, wow, at least my eyes get a little bit of a treat to right. see something different and it helps them almost visually cue that there is something different there. Mm -hmm. Now, the different colors that do show up for that, does that... This episode is brought to you by xraytech.org, the Rad Tech Career Resource. If you're considering a career in radiology, check out xraytech.org to get honest information on schools, degree options, career paths, and salaries. Uh, specify, like, you know, it, well, obviously it's a denser area, but that it could be something other than it not being something. I don't know. I don't think I'm I not get classifying. That. Yeah. I that's the right way. But do you know, do you understand what I'm trying to hear? Yeah. Malignant versus benign. Yeah. We're right. not, we're not, we're not classifying yet. We have the ability to, we obviously have to go through those regulatory filings. That's this, uh, you know, a secondary filing, but um, uh, we are not kind of making that we're showing the different versions. I mean, you know, as radiologists, you, you know, everybody knows that something that is round and um, is uniform assist it's you know fibers it's you know fi you know things like that non-cancerous you know but if you start seeing different levels of of uh density which the colors will just show up as different gradients almost like a topography map when you go um when you go hiking you know it'll show the different areas so that you can see oh actually this is starting to radiate out it's starting to get irregular you know it shows the boundaries of the speculation which is highly indicative uh you know of a malignancy um but again, visually, just allowing them to maybe make a easier, faster, you know, move move from, hey, you, you know, you're going to a screen. Hey, we're actually going to send you straight to a diagnostic. We're not going to send you, you know, to all the 27 steps in between. Like, we see that this is something we want to send you immediately. Or actually, yep, this is the same as last year. No worries. Hasn't grown, hasn't changed, hasn't morphed, hasn't done anything. You're good. We'll see you in six months or a year whatever, you know, the treatment is for, here's this, here's that. And then you're so sometimes left with the, with the, the phrase, we don't know if we saw everything, but, uh, you know, see you in a year. I mean, I get that letter myself and I'm in this industry and it makes me panic. So just imagine any other, you know, normal human who doesn't do this for a living. And, um, you know, we want to, you know, so that they can say, oh, okay. So did you analyze those areas of density with deep book? No, uh, you did? And you didn't see anything, right? I feel like I feel better about it, you right. know? And then like, listen, it's not, again, like I said, radiologists want to give the right information. Sure. They just don't have the tools to do that. So we're one of the, you know, the multiple tools that are able to do that. But yeah, in everybody's chart, if you have dense breasts, it should show up with your density rating, your BIRAD rating. Um, and again, there's a lot of great, great tools out there that are doing it. Um, and we are an augment on top of those things. Okay. 
All right. Um, are you guys currently out in a, a good amount of like health systems within the country or are you kind of in more a particular area like southeast or over on the west coast or I don't know? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're working to scale right now. So um, we have just recently gone commercial, which is exciting. We're working on our first sales now. But the way that we distribute our software is through our partners because it's, you know, it's just more efficient. These are multi-billion dollar companies that are already have sales channels and already established in each, um, in each hospital system. So they're actually going out and selling our technology, um, which is a benefit to them as well. And um, so we're working with them to leverage, you know, the contacts that we have and contacts that they have and, you know, making those sales. No, this is a global, you know, like this is a US wide UK Canadian, like we're, we're spreading around. We want everybody to have these technologies and these tools. Um, but we just found it honestly, just a little smarter to use economies of scale with very large companies you know, it would take us two years to get into each individual hospital system yeah. between yeah. the cybersecurity and the, you know, su approved supplier and vendors and all of these things. It takes years to get into these systems. And there's very few individual practices left. Um, and so, but yeah, we're working on several of them. Um, many more to be announced soon. Um, so yeah, I mean, if anybody wants it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about like you're pairing with say like a company like McKesson who is already like has like a pack system open within say like that's the health system that I work for. That's who they use. Are you, is that what you mean you're pairing with them? Yeah. So first of all, okay. I definitely want to talk to you uh, about McKesson, but, <laughs> but we're partnering with, uh, so one of our biggest partners is Barco who okay. makes all the, of the monitors for mammography, Nine, they own 90% of the medical monitor um, industry. All the OEMs use them, all the hospital systems use them. Um, they're the best image quality, quite honestly, out there. So we're actually directly integrated into their monitors. And so it's kind of interesting, you know, so we're the first kind of software augment uh, on their new software platform that they can, you know, it's, a, it's like an app, you download it, it's there. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's kind of our partnerships because again, they're already in the hospitals. They're already selling to them. You know, they're they're through the OEMs. And then, you know, we're working to to work with some of the PAC systems as well, um, so that everybody can communicate back and forth all the information. Um, and yeah, that like th those are the types of channels that uh, certainly I'm talking about. Because I mean, as a McKesson, you know, you're you're integrated already. To add another software that's part of you takes very little effort versus multiple years of me trying to get into a system. <laughs> Yeah. And especially like you said, like where uh, information can be integrated together. Um, so information can be shared yeah. across like platforms. Exactly. I feel like thankfully we're, we're finally trending in that direction. Um, you still have some kind of companies who, you know, I, I feel like, so not, I'm not like trying to like name, like name yeah. call or, you know what I mean? But we use Epic where I work and, you know, I, I work in the Philadelphia area. And I know that the the larger health systems in the build up here all use Epic. So it's great because information can be shared amongst the three major uh, health systems. So exactly. I mean, it's along of what you were saying, being able to share the information for sure. Well, everything's becoming centralized. And so that's the important part. And when, when we think about it, we need the patients to have that information and the physicians of those patients to have all of the information together instead of having to say, oh, uh, sorry, can you hand me a CD of my <laughs> films that I can walk across the street to the other hospital where my doctor is? That's, it's just not an efficient way. And you know, we're in the healthcare industry and half the time we don't do that. So just imagine people who are not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've got the DL Precise. Um, is Deep Look in the midst of um, like moving DL Precise uh, in a, like not, in a different direction, but honing it more, or are they looking to develop another product to go underneath the deep look name? Well, so both. Um, so <laughs> we are right now optimizing DL precise, um, past, uh, breast mammography. So breast ultrasound, lung, liver, thyroid, that's kind of our pathway right now. Um, and it, all it is, <clears throat> excuse me, is an optimization. It's not, we're not doing anything different. It's just, you know, ultrasounds are black and white versus white and black. Um, so you just need to, to augment those. But then, excuse me, um, we have our new products that will be coming out probably in Q3 of this year. 
Um, and it's an augment to, uh, to what we're doing. It's called Lesion Library. Um, and we're able to visually match with known uh, biopsied ground truth um, that have been loaded and AI has been trained with it. And um, it can give a visual representation. And on a simple scale, it's kind of like a kid's matching game. Hey, you have an orange cat with stripes. Like what are the three or seven other orange cat with stripes that look the same? Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know they have known pathology and we can state what the known pathology is to say, here's yours. Here's what it could match to. And by the way, it might not match to anything, which means you, know, you have to make your own decision on what it is. Or we also have it loaded with benign. Here's your benign, you know, here's your lesion and it matches with benign. Again, not decision support, not yet, but like a visual matching to say, here are other ones that the algorithm has been trained to. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's just, it's a helpful hint. A helpful um, tool for sure. I yeah, mean, so it's a tool, uh, you know, a tool to, to make a bit, again, to make a better decision and make a more informed decision. Um, instead of having to like, you know, leaf through, uh, all your medical journals, you just are able to, you know, look it up on the screen. It's kind of the same thing. Sure. So are you, is that for like specific body parts at this point where you said? Liver? Yeah, we'll be starting with breast, um, okay. just cause that's a kind of our core, um, okay. uh, you know, area, but, um, yeah. And then we'll be expanding to everything else. Um, of course, uh, DL precise will be available for all other, you know, other body parts before that, you know, or, it, or in collaboration with it. Um, they don't need to be optimized at the same speed. So, or at the same time. So um, we're actually currently optimizing for breast ultrasound now and starting with lung, um, just because it's a really hot area in imaging right now. Um, and lung so, is? yeah, yeah. Finally, there's, it's this, it's only the second um, annualized screening that's been approved um, in many states um, and uh, hopefully federally soon uh, to be covered by insurance, especially starting with smokers and family of smokers. And then eventually to everybody else. Um, so yeah. screening, I mean, not to get on a big topic of that, but screening, does that mean in terms of just like chest x-rays or an, a different yeah. type? Okay. Chest x-rays or low dose um, CT. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. So they that can happen two times a year? Uh, I think one time a year. One time. Okay. That's I think it's also whatever is prescribed, but, uh, and, and it's based on risk. And it, I mean, it's crazy. It, it's crazy how long that that was probably in the works for it to, to come through and it was finally... And that's Weird. something that possibly, I mean, like, I know we have to be radiation conscious, but I mean, honestly, getting a chest x-ray is like the equivalent of standing next to your microwave, possibly everyone don't go no, literally, I but... mean, getting it, you know, people are so worried about it, but like, we'll get into plane with no problem when, by the way, you have more radiation when you go on one flight than you do with your breast imaging. So, it, you know, sure. If you're going every day or you work in that room, sure. You should be protected. Right. But I mean, you know, if you're, if you're happy to get on a flight multiple times a year, you've already had more radiation or stand literally next to your microwave. Thankfully those have been shielded. So I think it's a little better than the eighties. Yeah. Um, but or um, holding your cell phone, like next year, right, holding your cell phone. I mean, you know, there's all these things like you stand next to all these devices and you know, they're all radiating. So, you know, I like that that myth has been completely debunked. And, you know, for anybody who uses that as an excuse, it's uh, completely irrelevant, especially if you're okay getting in an airplane. Well, that's, I mean, it's great news then about the screening for, for lung cancer, especially for people who smoke or like you said, family members, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And unfortunately women have a um, three or four times higher likelihood of developing lung, non-smoker lung cancer. Oh, and so, you know, again, it presents as a woman's health problem and it's not just, you know, the screening is first and foremost, you have to start with someone. So start, of course, with the targeted population of smokers and their family who are around it. But then, you know, lung cancer is actually um, quite, is growing quite frequently in, uh, in women who are non-smokers. So let's talk about, cause you keep talking about equity and like, you know, with uh, women and then certain groups within women, let's talk about your, your health equity, right? Her health ec, right? Is that how you say it? Her health EQ. Her health EQ. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Talk to me about that. I mean, it, it seems great that you, you want to get, you know, medical devices out there and screenings and, and things like that for women who, I guess, is it for maybe less privileged or it, it just like a lower income area or just across the board for women in general? 
Yeah, it's typically in lower income areas. So we focus on um, uh, middle income countries. So not the US, not Europe, not, you know, Japan. Uh, we focus on um, you know, middle income countries all around the world. So in Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa, um, and um, we deploy medical equipment. Sometimes it's used, sometimes it's new. Um, and it depends obviously on our donors and what is needed. Um, but we focus on uh, the non-communicable diseases that really affect women that screening, prevention, or detection uh, equipment can help. So uh, cervical cancer and breast cancer, two really big areas, heart disease, maternal health. All of those, you know, I'm in the equipment space. Like I've been in the equip medical device equipment space my entire career. So like, that's what I knew. There's also a lot of other organizations that are working on, you know, pharmaceuticals and vaccines and so many other things. The wonderful kind of, you know, benefit of when you reach this middle income level is that unfortunately, most of your, um, your government aid and international aid turns off. So it's like great that you've reached the status, but your international aid has turned off right. and people are living longer because you've kind of reached this middle income status as far as a country goes, but you now don't have cancer prevention or maternal health services. Um, so you're not dying of, you know, uh, uh, waterborne diseases or, uh, you know, malaria as much, or, you know, things like that. But now you're living long enough to develop cancer or have more children. Um, and you know, the, the burden of, of life in general, uh, falls on a woman, but most especially in a developing country. And, um, you know, she's the one who's sending her girls to school and the girls are being pulled out when their mother, their grandmother, their aunt, their sister is sick. Right. And so, you know, being a woman in STEM, I want girls to go to school and, I can't fix the education system. Like that's not my specialty. Mine's healthcare. So let's get them the equipment that they need so that they can continue to be in school because their family members are healthy um, and are contributing to society and to their family. And it's something like 98% of a woman's salary goes back to her family, but only 40% of a man's does. Well, let's get her, you know, healthy so that she can contribute to her family and make like pull them out of poverty. And so, um, yeah, we want to make sure that there's healthcare for women all around the world. And oftentimes the barrier is, is the cost of this equipment. Um, so either at a low, low cost or for free, we deploy medical equipment um, to many, uh, many countries around the world. So you're pairing then, I guess, with companies like Hologic, like who you used to work for or Kodak, I guess not Kodak, I'm thinking of film. <laughs> <laughs> they've gone digital for sure but, but you know but like Siemens and, and other companies who make you know different either ultrasound machines or breast imaging or even x-ray equipment I assume yeah that, so yeah and we've taken it out of the imaging space too so we do um imaging for uh using colposcopy um for cervical cancer uh viewers or um EKG machines or ECG machines for heart um detection heart you know heart disease detection uh maternal fetal, fetal monitors um, and, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, certainly imaging is core to very much a lot of things that I do and, and it was, ne is necessary in the world, but, uh, there's so many other types of equipment, um, you know, that is needed too. So yeah, we partner with the medical device manufacturers, um, to hopefully obtain the equipment for free or, you know, buy it at a very low cost and then deploy them out to, uh, you know, to, to regions around the world. We're currently in nine different countries two wow. countries repeated. Uh, we're about to deploy in about four other countries in the next, uh, in the next few months. So, you know, we're moving. We obviously took a pause for COVID because nobody cared about, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, non-communicable diseases, but unfortunately they're now rising at a much higher rate. So we need to be focused on that. Mm -hmm. What, what are the different areas that you're in that you've gone into? Like maybe could you just tell the countries, uh, the countries that you, if you know off the top of your head that you're already in? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we're in Costa Rica, uh, Tanzania, um, my goodness, um, Burkina Faso. Uh, we have deployed to the U.S. actually a piece of equipment. Uh, we've sent supplies to the Ukraine as well. We are in Vietnam. Um, we are in Jamaica. Um, I think I'm getting close to nine, but I'm not sure. Um, but <laughs> we have projects that are upcoming in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Guatemala, in Mexico, in uh, South Africa and hopefully Indonesia. 
So, you know, we, we're, we're kind of spreading uh, around, certainly, uh, you know, the need. Do you do just like research on to see what, com uh, not companies, excuse me, what countries are, you know, in desperate need or are you reaching out to, you know, different healthcare providers in, in countries? How, yeah, do you, and we, how do you figure out where you want to go next? Yeah, it's based on partnership. So we don't run our own clinics. We don't run our own centers. Uh, we need to deploy the equipment to people who are running them in country, quite honestly. And so um, we sometimes have inbound. Sometimes it's through people we know. Sometimes it's through partners. Sometimes it's through our, uh, you know, some of our donors that say, hey, we'd like to do a project in XYZ country um, because we have a facility there and uh, we'd like to give back to the community. And, um, you know, that's that's sometimes how we work too. And, um, and so we work with um, other organizations and other NGOs. We work with, you know, people through our network. Um, and I have a great board um, who has great connections as well. And so, um, you know, we deploy with, um, with other people in country. I will never um, set up our own uh, clinic. That's just not who we are. There's plenty of incredible physicians, plenty of fabulous doctors and nurses in each country that are super trained. The only thing that they're lacking is the equipment to do their job better. And so um, we're just filling that gap. That's a huge gap to fill. And I'm sure that they are unbelievably thankful, you know, for that gap to be filled. Yeah. And we're talking about people, you know, again, who, who don't have equity and women don't have equity, you know, so we're talking about people in countries that don't have access. All this is, is access to equipment. And, you know, that's the important thing. And you can lead such a healthier life as a result of having access to, you know, screening, detection, prevention, equipment, um, just like we do here in the U.S. and in Europe and around the world. And again, it's an equity thing. Like why just because they live in a country, a different country doesn't mean they should have different health care. And we're trying to just bridge that gap until maybe, you know, the government has the money to be able to, um, you know, fulfill every single hospital uh, that they've built. You know, it unfortunately should be that way here in the U.S. as well. You know what I mean? True. Very true. <laughs> But Very true. And that's one of the reasons why we deployed um, some maternal health um, screening equipment to rural Mississippi, who uh, to a great uh, organization, Plan A Healthcare, and they run mobile vans up and down the Mississippi Delta, which yeah. it has a, a very large gap in equity related to healthcare. That's crazy. So when you're deploying to these different um, areas, like countries, or even like you said, in the part of like the United States, are you going along and helping with this equipment? Not setting it up, but you're going with them? Sometimes I am. And a lot of times I like to visit to make sure it's in use. Um, you know, one of the things we, we require is that they send metrics and how many, you know, people have been using the equipment. So, you know, I like to go, I, you know, I want to, I want to see it. I want to, I want to make sure it's being used. It's not, this is not equipment that I want sitting on a shelf. So um, sometimes, uh, you know, it forces people to say, oh yeah, we are using it or there's a problem. So, you know, we sometimes bring our partners with us to do some training um, or, um, you know, or if there needs to be installation sometimes. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I like, it's a benefit. I like to go to all these wonderful, incredible places. So <laughs> it's a benefit that we get to, uh, you know, that I get to travel to them. Uh, not all of them, not yet, but, uh, hopefully soon. The people that you're partnering with, do they do say like a, like a QC on the equipment that they're deploying out, say like once a year, or do they, you know, I feel like working with medical equipment, it, like it can be working today and tomorrow it just stops working for no reason. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, if you're working in a, in a larger health system or something, you know, you have biomed who's on, on call or on page, you know, so they can come and like fix it quickly. But, you know, if it's in a different country, that's not really the case. How, how do you know how that's handled? Yeah. So actually we make sure that there's biomed available and um, we actually ensure and we pay for uh, multiple uh, year contracts for service. So um, if something breaks down and this is why we require uh, metrics every quarter, because then we can see what is, you know, what was the estimate. And, you know, if you're at zero, either you've completely solved the problem or something's wrong with the equipment. And I want to know either way. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of times we're proactive, but not every country feels that way. They feel embarrassed. So the way to ask if something's being used is to get the usage. Um, and yeah, so we make sure that there is service available either in country remotely, or we will send somebody, um, you know, and make sure, you know, if it's a part, we'll make sure that that gets there too. That's just part of, um, you know, we can't send our trash somewhere else. Right. 
And, you know, just because we feel great doing it and it breaks down within three weeks and then it can't be used, like that's just a complete transference of trash. And that's not our intention in the least. I hope that one day that the equipment is used so much, it is broken because they've used it too much. And if that's the case, I'll get them another one. Mm -hmm. Like if it's used so much, you know, hundreds of thousands of times and has actually used up their useful life, no problem. That's the best problem for us to have. We'll get another one for you. Right. That's great. So speaking of challenges, um, you know, obviously you face these different challenges with dealing, you know, with equipment in other countries, but what challenges has Deep Look kind of encountered with the development of the software and then implementing it, um, getting it into like different health systems, but it's great. Like you said, it's already in the Barco um, detect, not detectors, but monitors. Yeah. Monitors. Yes. Um, Listen, it's hard to implement another technology. And, you know, we get a lot of resistance like I already have AI. Okay. Yeah, you do. And, um, you know, you're using about seven AI tools actually, but uh, here's another eighth one that does something totally different. So it's a lot of convincing. Um, You know, listen, like we're not replacing radiologists. We're not replacing anybody. The The thing is like an AI is never going to, not for, you know, 50 years, but you're, but the radiologists that don't use AI are going to be replaced. And that's the important part. Like there needs to be an adoption of technology. It took, it took 10 years to get 3d mammography, uh, you know, really adopted on a worldwide scale at 50%. So, I mean, you know, it's going to take time. So, um, you know, just working with them and convincing and saying, Oh, how else, how can this help you? Things like that. That's always a challenge. And I think that's a challenge for any technology. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the added layer that we're not handling sales directly. So, um, you know, making sure that the other teams are, you know, moving forward on the distribution of our technology. Um, that's just, a that's just a management, uh, thing that has to be managed. Have you received feedback from, you know, radiologists who are using it? Yeah, of course. So, um, the thoughts. I'm sure they're one of them, like, this is amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, of course, and I'm never going to tell you the bad stuff, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, we had, we had one radiologist that I thought was just going to be a big old no. And she said that she was like, oh my God, this actually makes my day easier. And I was like, I'm oh, sorry, did, did those words just come out of your mouth? Mm-hmm. You know, like, really? Did that happen? Um, and she was like, it just it makes me feel more confident. It makes it easier. And so that's great. Um, you know, especially from, uh, radiologists who sometimes are non-adoptive of technology, you know, thankfully in radiology and especially in breast imaging, it's been the first area that AI has really taken, not, not taken over, but been implemented. Um, and now we can go throughout the entire, you know, pathway. Um, and so, um, there's a lot more people who are willing to adopt it. Listen, the visualness of it is super helpful. It just makes it clearer and more obvious and either to say a yes or no, yes, to move on to to other imaging or no, you're good. Um, And it just, it gives, it gives them more confidence. And that's a lot of the feedback that we've been given. Besides the FDA approval, was there anything that had to be done with the the MQ essay that, you know, was in place for, you know, standards of mammography to that? No, it doesn't affect us. And actually we're helping everyone stay within their standards. Um, because they're not ordering excess imaging, uh, which a lot of them are actually, um, over their cavitation rates. And so, um, no, we're, I mean, like we're, we're, we're compliant to all standards. Um, but, um, you know, we're not fully, uh, integrated, you know, related to that. We are obviously going after CE marks. So we have to go after MDR and all of those requirements as well. When we go into Europe, um, that's a very long process with a lot of paperwork. So, uh, we're just starting that now. Wow. Is that like it, like years type process? Do you years, think? really? Yeah, and it's and it doesn't. It, it's years only because um, I, I personally just don't think they're staffed very well. I mean, they just don't have enough people. You know, very similar to the FDA, but um, it just it takes a long time to get through the process. Um, and certainly, it's not. I'm not the only one saying that. Like, this is a big uproar in the industry. Okay, is was Canada along the same lines of a, approval time? Uh, with the United States or? Yeah. So Canada, um, Canada, Mexico, Israel, UK, they accept the, the FDA. Uh, oh, okay. acceptance. And so a lot of times it's, you know, paperwork and registrations and things like that. So, um, you know, we're using our US FDA in, in any location that we possibly can. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting that they, that so many different countries do accept it, but Europe as collectively will not. Interesting. Correct. Correct. Um, 
Well, this is, this was great. I mean, finding out about all this, um, especially for myself, I've shared with uh, our guests before that I just turned 40 and I'll be getting my first mammogram as soon as I go get my script. <laughs> yes, do um, it. But it just, I've talked to yourself and, you know, a few other guests about, you know, the world of mammography and things like this it just has my mind churning. Um, but it's great. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to know that there's technology out there that can help, you know, ease your mind. You know, I don't know if I have dense breasts, but <laughs> we'll find out soon. If I did, you know, I, I would hope that possibly something like this would be able to be used, you know, for sure. I hope so. Looking at my imaging. So Marissa, thank you for taking the time with me today. Everybody, this is Marissa Fayer with us from Deep, Deep Look Medical. Excuse me. <laughs> thanks. Great. For thanks for uh, so much for having me. All right, guys, we'll see you next week. Thanks again. You've been watching The Skeleton Crew, brought to you by xraytech.org. On the next episode, join us to explore the present and the future of the rad tech career in the field of radiology.